investment and socially responsible investment. Our members use a, a set of tools that include grant, debt, equity, and other innovative social instruments, which I'll talk about, as well as, of course, capacity building through human capital and intellectual capital. Next one. This just tells you about, you know, how broad the footprint of Asia is and the footprint of AVPN is. It is important because I think Asia and Latin America are two very large continents. Um, you are all from Brazil, where you speak Portuguese. A lot of the other parts of Latin America speak Spanish, but you know, you, it's, it's interesting, right? If you look at my geography, you will see we have many languages that we have to deal with, whether it be Bahasa in Indonesia, Chinese, Mandarin in, in, in the People's Republic of China, uh, or English in Singapore and India. We, we traverse a lot of languages. And why I, I think this slide is important in today's context is the fact that the network actually connects all of these different countries. And we find that there is many more things in common that you know people can learn from each other about uh, and uh, from each other from rather than on the differences that exist, whether those differences be cultural or linguistic. If you go to the AVPN website, uh, which is www.avpn.asia, you will see a study that we have called the social investment landscape. Now we looked at 14 economies across Asia and actually compared them vis-a-vis -vis where they were uh, around, this, around the SDGs, what was the investment landscape in each country and how could you as a social investor decide where you want to put your capital with. The next few slides that I'm going to be talking about actually um, reflect some of the insights of our uh, social investment landscape. In terms of our membership, as you can see, we talked about the silos slide. There are foundations, family offices, corporates, impact funds, private equity, intermediaries, as well as uh, development finance institutions. We have about 650 members that come from 36 different countries. And this is just a snapshot of the ones that we felt. Uh, some of you may have seen their logos or, or know of them, and some are um, you know, maybe much more local from, from Asia. Next one. Uh, so this is what I refer to as a social investment landscape. So why this slide is important is like Latin America, the countries in Asia are at different levels of maturity. The, uh, the, they are, there are some that are very nascent in terms of their uh, landscape vis-a-vis uh, -vis social investment. And there are others which are much more mature. This has nothing to do with how developed or undeveloped that country is. So if you look at India, you will see it is a very mature social investment landscape. The reason being there are a large number of social enterprises. Obviously, the country has a huge number of social problems. It also has a large market. And therefore, you have a lot of interest from impact investors, as well as foundations who want to do grant funding in a country like India. Similarly, you will see that South Korea as well has a very developed social investment landscape. Myanmar, on the other hand, is very nascent. So you will see that these, these countries actually are at different levels. Next slide. So I was telling you about the insights. There have been two emerging trends in the philanthropic space in Asia. One, as I mentioned before to you, Asia is seeing one of the highest growths of, of wealth or the creation of wealth in the world. And second, there is a huge um, sort of... Um, uh, movement of capital from one generation to the next. And, and these two trends have actually led to a huge increase in, in the amount of giving for impact. So for example, if you look at the People's Republic of China, in 2009, the total giving was 6 billion US dollars. In 2017, it was 23.4 billion US dollars. If I look at Singapore, which is where we are based, $700 million in 2008 and $1.53 billion in 2018. Uh, the increase in wealth has actually, what, what, what has led to this, this dramatic growth and you know, the formalization of the philanthropic ecosystem. In addition, we are finding that a lot of the next generation of philanthropists is looking to be far more innovative and more effective and accountable in terms of their philanthropic giving. 
We're also finding that Asian foundations are actually looking at the ways to explore impact beyond traditional grant making. So on your screen, you see Narada Foundation, which is one of the largest private foundations in China. Now, this was the first Chinese foundation to actually conduct mission-related investment by allocating part of its endowment for impact when it invested seven and a half million US dollars in the Yuhe Fund of Ehong Capital, which is an impact fund manager. This in COVID-19 or as a result of COVID-19, Narada Foundation continued to be a, a very forward-looking leader and launched the China Nonprofit Consortium with at least 10 other foundations in under a week to become a mechanism to deploy healthcare necessities to various cities in China. SK Happin the Happiness Foundation is, the found is a corporate foundation. It is a corporate foundation of the SK Group in South Korea, which is one of the largest corporates. And what we found with them is that they've actually shifted their philanthropic funding to actually support and build capacity for social enterprises across, across Korea. Sasakawa Peace Foundation is a foundation in Japan, which became one of the first foundations in Japan to allocate 100 million US dollars in 2017 to set up the Asian Women's Impact Fund. We are also seeing that there is an enormous amount of collaboration now, not just within countries, but actually across countries. We're finding the creation of pooled funds. So 10 to 19 is an adolescent girls collaborative set up by one of our members in India, Dasra, which is actually a pooled fund collaborative. It predominantly gives grants and it looks at uh, supporting women and girls in seven states across India. Philanthropy Indonesia has established five clusters around crucial crucial social issues to encourage knowledge sharing among its 55 foundation members. Uh, we have a new article which I contributed, which if any of you are interested, was published by Social Investor, which is a Chandler Foundation publication, which actually talks about these trends in philanthropic giving in, in Asia. Next slide, please. So we were talking, Doug talked a lot about private equity. So most Asian markets actually see, are seeing a growing interest in sustainable finance. Although Asia continues to still lag behind US and Europe in sustainable finance and ESG investing, there has been a growing traction amongst investors to actually invest in green products since 2015. Part of this has been led by China's initiative. So China in 2015 had zero green impact bonds. But now in 2018, actually we're in 2020 now, it has actually grown to more than USD $80 million in terms of green bond issuance. So they literally went in 2015 from zero green bonds to in 2018 to more than 200 green bonds. So literally from zero to hero, becoming the largest issuer of green bonds in Asia. And because of that, we find that mainstream investors are now taking a much bigger interest in sustainable finance and actually looking at investing in, in, in green products. In the 2018 Schroeder's Global Investor Survey, we found that in Indonesia, for instance, 73% of Indonesian investors said that they would invest in sustainable funds and 93% have recently increased their sustainable investments, which are the most of any country that have been surveyed. Now, in addition to green funds, we are also finding that there are a lot of local impact funds now in Asia. So it's not only that Asia receives a lot of impact investments from other regions, we're finding that within Asian countries, there are local impact funds that have been set up. In addition, there are co-investment platforms set up by organizations like Social Finance India, B Current in, in Taiwan, and Hong Kong Green Finance Associ uh, Association that actually look at creating and developing opportunities for co-investment and encouraging for investors to actually look at how they can participate in social investing. Next slide, please. So besides uh, investors, I also wanted to touch on corporates. 
and corporates are especially very important players in asia asia's social economy with a great potential for actually scaling impact part of the reason is that almost every corporate has a corporate foundation and each of those corporate foundations are extremely active around social investing so myanmar for instance you know which we said initially was a nascent uh, social economy well avpn started working in myanmar very actively thanks to a grant we got from one of our members uh, four years ago and now we find that in those four years there's been a huge development so the myanmar young entrepreneurs association formed the social enterprise and inclusive business committee to coordinate efforts to promote business solutions for myanmar's development challenges in addition you find even in philippines the philippines business for social progress foundation has actually create has more than 274 members and has given more than 50 million dollar grants in in 2017 alone we also see that there are large multinational corporates like chanel like hyundai like essilor and coca cola that have formed um, initiatives that have launched uh, projects and programs whether it be supporting social enterprises or looking at how they can incorporate sustainability into their supply chain and daily operations next slide please so why why are networks important as all of this happened why would you need a latin pacto or an avpn this i think is is really really important and and the reason is that you have all of these organizations doing phenomenally great stuff but very rarely do they come together and you know often times i have been told again and again that we come to avpn because we meet people in avpn that we don't meet elsewhere um i'll give you a few short examples i know i'm running out of time but i think it's important for you to to understand this um a lot of times we see that social investors are often working in silos they're duplicating efforts they which is basically resulting in a waste of scarce resources at the same time you see an enormous number of social enterprises startups who are seeking help but they are not sure where and how to find support so avpn through our network actually looked at and said how do we actually create a more enabling matching platform where funders can find organizations that they can support to do this in 2014 2015 we launched what was called the deal share platform the deal share platform is an online platform that is available to our members where our members can list organizations and projects that they may have supported and other members who are looking to fund whether it is by cause or by geography can find these organizations so that was the deal that was the thinking behind setting up of the deal share platform but we went one step further thanks to a partnership that we had with credit suisse we actually partnered with credit suisse and we used a a, a toolkit that had initially been developed by by village capital in the us which had a viral framework a self awareness tool that we actually adapted for asia that helped social entrepreneurs map out where they were and what were their expectations from funders yes. one of the biggest things you'll find as an investor is that expectations sometimes are misaligned between what you are looking to invest in and what the entrepreneur is looking to get from the investor the toolkit actually helps to align those expectations and when when we release the toolkit we find other members like eny like dbs uh swiss contact are actually using the toolkit to find investors to get them on the same kind of wavelength before they actually make the investment next slide please the other challenge which we did which is also very very interesting is one that involved kellogs which all of you know as well as um, uh sesame workshop the the people behind uh, uh sesame street uh the breakfast revolution which is a non-profit so this was very interesting because this partnership was seeded at an avpn conference kellogg's met with sesame workshop i think it was 3 years ago at at an avpn conference in singapore kellogg's didn't even realize that you know they could actually come into a partnership 
with Sesame Workshop. Kellogg's, as we all know, is uh, you know, the leading producer of breakfast food. Now, nearly 70% of school-going children in India are undernourished, and, and they don't really have a good breakfast. Kellogg was struggling to find a way because cornflakes are typically not something Indian children eat. And they were trying to find a way how they could do their CSR activity by providing their product to schools in India. Sesame Workshop created a program with them which actually looked at how they can socialize the importance of having breakfast by a program that Sesame Workshop runs in India called Gali Gali Sim Sim. And, and that, that partnership actually happened as a result of it now. There, is, there are 2,000 children who get breakfast five days a week with the aim that is going to be, you know, to scale that up further uh, this year. And that only happened because they met at an AVPN conference. So would it have been easy for them to meet without AVPN? Sure, maybe. But it would have taken much longer. You actually provided a platform, a via media, where people come saying that they are interested in the social sector, they are interested in social investment, and they are open and encouraged to find partnerships. And that is what networks actually do. Next slide, please. The, the COVID-19 crisis, and you know, all of you in Brazil are, are facing this as, as we speak. Uh, this is something which we find has, uh, has really brought our network into into play. You know, we have in Asia since the beginning of the year been dealing with this, with this crisis. A lot of our funders have um, looked at stopping all other programmatic funding that they're doing to focus on the crisis. The platform has provided a way for them to bring their efforts together, to look at how they can share learnings, to also look at how they can um, provide funding for urgent needs. So for instance, uh, the Gates Foundation approached us because they were looking initially in the, at the start of the crisis to get testing kits to India. Temasek Foundation in, in Singapore had a manufacturer that was actually producing testing kits. AVPN connected Temasek Foundation to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we helped for the shipment of 30,000 test kits to India way back in April. One of the big things, and like I said, Asia has been facing the COVID pandemic since the beginning of the year. And for us, we have gone to online education since the beginning of the year. Our, children, our schools have been shut since, since Chinese New Year for a large part of, part of Asia. So what we actually also organized in partnership with the World Bank was a one-day seminar to actually bring various um, public educators from, I think it was nine states in India with five countries across Asia so that they could share what were the challenges about uh, you know, distributing online education. How would you actually distribute content? How would you get electronic devices or iPads or computers to low-income populations? How would you actually provide educational support when it could be just the first generation that was actually uh, getting exposed to education? And we did that because we have a pan-Asian platform that brings policymakers as well as private sector funders together. Next slide, please. Um, for that reason, as I talked to you about is, you know, why I think, what I think is the biggest value of networks like AVPN or Latin Pacto is the fact that you can actually foster collaborations amongst unusual players. So this year at the AVPN conference, we launched something called the Constellations, which actually recognizes outstanding collaborative solutions addressing complex issues. Each of these collaborations has come with multi-sectoral partners, whether it be a foundation, a corporate, a government policymaker, or you know, some, some combination thereof. And, and these, some of these partnerships have, have crossed geographies, some of them have crossed different sectors, but each of them has talked about the fact that none of us can achieve much on going on this journey alone. Together, we can go faster, we can be stronger, and we can achieve a lot more. 
and that to me is the biggest value add of a of a network it actually fosters collaboration next slide please um we have a couple of other products that we actually run which may be interesting to latin pacto as you develop and we are very very happy to share of uh, all the intellectual capital in fact uh, carolina spent uh, about a week with us in the beginning of the year before the covid crisis and you know it was great to have her i think it was a different world back then uh, carolina when you were with us in singapore and bali but you know uh, i think from both evpa and avpn latin pacto has been able to uh, catalyze knowledge catalyze intellectual property and you will find that you know doug talked about how how much time it took for evpa to scale up evpn took a little bit less time and i'm thinking i'm seeing the way latin pacto is growing i feel like you know you guys will be at our stage much faster than you know anybody could have imagined uh next slide in terms of you know as i said we are a we are a network that actually focuses on on action and i i and you know if i had to give you any takeaways i would actually tell you uh um, let's make sure whatever you build is is action oriented because at the end of the day you don't want to be a talk shop you want to see how can capital be deployed and how can that capital be deployed for impact so in order to do that we actually created a uh, thematic platforms one of course was around covid this year where as of uh, as of now more than 9 billion dollars have been have been deployed across uh, asia by our members next slide the other one is gender we still find that gender is a huge issue across asia where one in five women don't have access to nutrition to good health care or to an education so we have a thematic platform that aggregates funders along gender next slide and our third one is actually along along climate action we have the only uh, pan asian climate action platform climate action is one of our biggest issues and as as uh, as it is in brazil as well um uh, you know for us we have the most amount of natural disasters and how you address those natural disasters is very important so far asian funders have not been as anxious to fund climate change as they were to fund education health and livelihoods but the covid crisis has shown that you can actually bring down uh, greenhouse gases to where they were to 20 years ago and therefore all is not lost and a lot of people felt that you know climate action is too big uh, an issue to solve in our own lifetimes but you know i'm i'm really happy to say that one of the most positive things to come out of the covid pandemic is the increased interest in actually funding climate action and looking at how you can really help preserve this world for our children and for our grandchildren i think that is the end of my presentation thank, thank you Naina. so much naina you. when welcome. we grow up we want to be with like you <laughs> so naya want to invite virgilio barco uh, he is director for latin america at acumen and he will present the importance of the early stage catalytic and patient capital please virgilio the mic is yours hey everyone um pleasure to be here and uh can you hear me all right yes we can okay um great alexander um doug and uh, carolina thank you thank you for the invitation and and uh, Uh, I'll speak very briefly because really what um I think we want is is a conversation. So I I am the head of Acumen in Latin America based in Bogota. Acumen is a organization its mission is uh to change the way the world tackles poverty. And it was one of the pioneering organizations in impact investing uh almost 20 years ago started by Jack the Novogratz We have another part that's quite important which is a leadership um 
development area. It's called Acumen Academy. And we believe that's almost as important as the in investing part because um, Jacqueline Novogratz often says that our investment thesis is to invest in character. If you invest in the right people with the right values, things uh, will uh, generally turn out uh, well. So there's a, a whole lot of uh, courses available. Uh, Jacqueline Novogratz just published a book called Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. I see it sort of uh, if investing and all the instruments are the hardware, um, this is a little bit the software, what we need in order to make, um, to make uh, the right um, investing decisions. Acumen has two different funding vehicles and they're quite distinct. And, and so I'm, I have a pretty um, broad perspective on um, what venture philanthropy can do, its limitations, and also what impact investing can do and also its limitations. So we have, we have this um, fund called the Acumen Pioneer Fund. It, it invests in very early stage companies, uh, companies that, ch that they have enormous potential to, um, for social impact, but that, um, you know, the, the, just the financial return of those companies, the cash flows, what, what's going, how they're, they're going to do many pivots, what's going to happen there, it's just, it's just unknown. And we feel that traditional, you know, uh, impact investing, equity, debt, just doesn't work there because um, it's, it's putting a straitjacket that these companies just can't handle. And so we talk about patient capital. It's, it's a capital that is funded. We, the, the source of that capital is, is philanthropy. We have donors that commit money and allow us to make um, very risky but um, innovative um, investments into um, great ideas. And, and, I, and th this is, you know, so we talk about the missing, the, the, the valley of death, as Doug mentioned, or the missing middle. This is the first part of it. It's, it's the early stage social, social uh, enterprise. It's just this very little capital out there just because the risk return um, equation is, is, is so, so difficult to, to measure. And, and so um, there's an important role for foundations, for uh, governments, for many actors to fund that early, early um, part of the uh, spectrum. And I know that that's this impact first um, um, uh, part of the, of the spectrum, which I, under, I, I understand is, is um, um, let impact those uh, focus. And, and it's an important piece. And also the intermediaries, as Doug mentioned, the accelerators and other players are very important and also uh, need funding. And, and so that, that's, that's one place where we, we play. This has been historically what we've been doing. Uh, we've been in Latin America for about six years um, and most of our portfolios in Colombia and that impact will be actually showcasing one of our early stage investments in the coming uh, months, which is um, a chocolate company. And I, I won't go into it, but it, when we invested, it was really like, a, it was like a kitchen in, uh, with some uh, entrepreneurs with a wonderful idea and it's turned out quite well and a lot of impact. Uh, but, um, um, you know, you, we didn't know. And if we didn't have this patient capital, we wouldn't ever have done that investment. And then we have a second vehicle. We see that a lot of these early stage companies grow. They figure out their business model. They start to get traction. They put together good um, um, teams and they may start accessing some capital. A lot of it may be with a personal guarantee by the entrepreneurs or maybe just some working capital but then they hit a roadblock because there is um, very limited, uh, uh, limited capital in Latin America and in other emerging, car, um, uh, emerging markets for early, what we call early growth companies. These are companies that 
need money to grow, but they're not ready for private equity. And so we put together a fund for that segment. This is a fund that is more commercial in nature. It has um, investors, it has a, uh, a traditional private equity structure, and it, it invests in mission-aligned uh, companies that uh, need this, this, this uh, capital to grow and also the accompaniment that, that, we, that, we, um, that we provide. And um, within our portfolio, we have a Brazilian company called Levy. It's a, this is a company that is automating the whole HR um, process for companies that hire large, large numbers of uh, um, blue collar, low skilled uh, workers. And, you know, it brings efficiencies to the um, recruiting process, but what is really interesting, um, we thought, was how by automating and by using machine learning, it eliminates the human bias in these processes. And so the result is many more women candidates, many more um, Afro-descendant uh, candidates, many more people with uh, disabilities. And so um, you know, this is a company that um, also has impact at, the, at its core, but um, and has achieved a certain scale, but was you know facing um, hurdles to uh, raise capital. So that that's that's it. So we're we're I'm, I'm a practitioner. I I I, um, I I see these you know the the needs in the in the so-called uh, valley of death and also the role that many of the actors and the uh, people around the table today um, have in growing the, the sector. So I'm uh, going to pause there if, and, and um, hopefully um, we can have a um, uh, stimulating uh, conversation. Well, thank you, Virgilio. Uh, I'll, I'll take on the Q&A session now. Uh, just, uh, Taking a look at the questions that have been raised, uh, I think one of uh, very interesting question. Uh, maybe Doug, you could comment, and and perhaps uh, many of you that uh, desire to complement, which is how do you uh, accommodate different types of capital? So, for example, uh, you can on on the one hand uh, allocate capital to entrepreneurs, but when you look at the perspective of the of the investors. Um, and if you look, you know, maybe there's first loss, maybe you can even redistribute the excess return to other investors, you know, to get closer to the impact investors. Um, what are possibilities to do that? And, and how does each one of the stakeholders feel about that? So uh, Eduardo Rossi from Peninsula, which is one of the largest uh, family offices in Brazil, single family offices, he, he left, but he left this question, you know, how would people feel if you have the uh, uh, third sector or philanthropists and foundations or institutions uh, having the first loss or maybe only having the re uh, negative returns or maybe up to the uh, uh, to the principal only and other people profiting from that you know how would people feel about that and, and, and I think that you know the, the answer is a concessionary capital catalytic capital so Doug and also uh, some you have some uh, negative return mandates, right? And I don't think people are familiar with the concept here in Brazil. So it will be very interesting to listen uh, from you guys, you know, what uh, a few examples of people that have a less 10% return, less 20% return. You know, people often think of, you know, 20 plus returns, you know? So uh, these questions for us to start with. Uh you want me to uh, to take the first shot at that, and then others can uh, come in. Uh huh. Please. Okay. So uh, one of the things that, that we're very interested in is uh, in seeing different forms of capital uh, come together. And uh, what you I refer to them as structured deals. And uh, I did my first structured deal 15 years ago for a echo tourism camp in Mozambique. So my money was the bottom layer of the money, but it was 
what I call philanthropic money, but I put it in as a recoverable loan, not expecting to recover it, to, to be quite honest. That brought in uh, Ford Foundation money uh, from a grant uh, perspective because uh, we had gotten it uh, up through the first stage. And that brought in uh, a, a bank loan from a uh, Mozambique bank. And it's now 15 years later, and that ecotourism camp actually worked. And uh, it's evolved into uh, uh, making organic honey and also a uh, billbob. But you don't see enough of those deals. Uh, and the reason you don't see enough of them is there are too few intermediaries to put those deals together. So you have to find a group that is prepared to do the, uh, you know, the, 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 the first lost layer, if you will. You have to find uh, somebody uh, on the impact investment side, so different forms of capital. But if you don't have intermediaries and it takes so long to do these things. The other thing I would note is that uh, two things. One is we deal with a lot of very high net worth family offices and they don't necessarily uh, you know, need a, a five or seven or eight or 10% rate of return because they can get that on their other investments that they have. But what they like to have is a, an opportunity for a return of capital so they can recycle that into uh, other opportunities. And, 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 and I do that a lot. I'm not high net worth, but, but I like the recycle. Uh, and the, but, but the difficulty is when it gets into the impact investment space, everybody's happy with that because it's, it's more capital, it gives more room for growth, more sustainability, but there has to be a clear commitment to retaining the social impact because you can increase your financial return by you know, reducing the quality or, or increasing the number and stuff like that. So if, if I'm doing a deal like that, I put a provision in that says, you know, irrespective of what happens, you, know, you have to retain the, the social uh, impact. That's also true, by the way, with the social entrepreneur. Uh, it, they wouldn't necessarily want the uh, group to be sold on an exit to some organization that didn't, you know, maintain the social impact. But uh, I'm sure other people have other thoughts and comments on that, but that's, that's my kind of initial start. Virgilio, maybe you, that you are managing both, or you have the portfolio and maybe you can answer this question as well. How do you manage both? Yeah, no, I, 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 I think Doug, Doug um, hit on the right, uh, point. There's, there's different types of capital that are necessary with different risk returns. And, you know, some investors are looking for more commercial returns. Some of them may seek moderate returns. Some of them want capital preservation. But there's a very important role for foundations, for, um, you know, other actors to layer in different different types of, of capital and, and and particularly in the early stages of of social ventures that are so risky uh provide them with the capital that is um that is needed um so um so i think i think uh, there's a role for 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 everyone and and also as doug mentioned some important uh safeguards that, that need to be put in as well uh for example you know um, deviation from the social mission. Um, so, so I, um, I fully agree with, with his, um, his perspective. So Nena, you want to add something or Nena? So, um, um, one of the things I'd actually like to share is one of our members, I was uh, on a panel with him last week and he has uh, the third largest VC fund. And, and, you know, they've just started measuring their portfolio around impact. And one of the things he did say was that, you know, even as an investor, when they were looking at investing, they invested in solutions that were really um, sort of the solutions that were really needed or, you know, in companies that were actually looking to solve 
um, unsolved problems, which is where they found that the impact was being created. So to build on what, what, uh, what you just said, you know, in terms of um, different funders looking for different objectives, I think one of the things that networks like ours do is they bring funders along a continuum together. So when you are initially looking at solving a social problem, uh, that is something a foundation or a grant maker is very keen to see. And that is the KPI that he or she is measured by. When that, you know, if, if they kind of set up or pay, do the initial investing to solve that problem, and then you're looking at scaling that solution where it eventually might bring in a degree of sustainability and then finally also a measure of financial return. It is a journey that that organization also goes through. And that is something I think that, you know, is, uh, is what investors need to understand and accept that it is not something that you're going to happen. The, mar the market has a variety of investments that produce a, a sort of sliding scale of social and financial returns. And as an investor, you decide where you want to come in. Networks like ours try and increase the funnel of these kinds of investments, which actually have a greater and greater amount of social return. Okay, just on the, the same uh, question, uh, when we were in Cartagena, we, we talked about that a little bit, and there are many questions about the, the concept of venture philanthropy and where it will stop. So, for example, uh, uh, to which extent do I step into the impact uh, industry? And, and yes, we do touch it because whenever I give up uh, potentially any type of return or I bring in investors, they're willing to accept a lower return as compared to the commercial uh, rates or returns, then that's the, you know, the type of capital that we're talking about. And as you mentioned, you have uh, uh, you know, foundations that will be happy to have their grants back, right? and others that perhaps part of their, their asset allocation, they want to be more aligned and have returns. And maybe they, they can have two different, two shares, you know, one share of the fund that will deliver uh, commercial returns and another share in the fund that will undertake the first loss, for example. So there are many uh, uh, opportunities to do that. Doug, uh, you want to comment on that? Sorry? Well, uh, Bridges, which was the first impact investment uh, group in the in the UK and is probably one of the biggest impact investors around. They have different types of funds. So funds that operate in the real estate industry and that, uh, you know, borrow commercial money, funds that operate in uh, just the poorest zip codes. Uh, and then uh, a fund which is uh, now called an evergreen fund, uh, which is uh, all around social uh, enterprise investment. But because these take a lot more time to mature, uh, they are uh, uh, the, the evergreen is, is there's there's no end, and so the investors can invest in the fund, uh, and they can exit uh, with a one year notice period, and they can get uh, uh, money back. But you're not forcing premature exits, so that's another uh, evolution that you see. Uh, also, if I'm correct, uh, Acumen Fund was actually, uh, uh, Jacqueline was actually sponsored by Rockefeller Foundation when it was uh, uh, established. So it's, a, it's a, an organization that came out of a foundation that, that if I, my knowledge is, is correct. Okay. Correct, correct, Doug. And, and it is also an evergreen fund. And, and an evergreen fund is very appropriate for early stage, you know, high risk, um, you know, venture philanthropy type investing because it, 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 it has the flexibility, it has the patience in order to accompany these uh, ventures uh, until they can be uh, sustainable where a more traditional impact investing, five-year investment period, five-year exit period is, is just really doesn't work for that type of investment, but does work for companies that are at a later stage that have proven out their models, that have, um, that have, um, you know, a clear um, path towards pro profitability and an, and, an, and an exit, and allows, you know, these more traditional uh, structures allow you to uh, bring in more commercial capital and 
increase the pool of investing for social good? Just, just to complete uh, on, on Acumen's approach to investment, there's one thing that makes it very clear that when you say that you invest your donations, so instead of giving donations away, you invest the donations. So I think this is a very important point because um, uh, when we talk about philanthropy, you don't expect to get it back. And we talk about venture philanthropy, you might get it back. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the way you put it, to invest the donations, it's, uh, I think it, it makes a huge difference. Yes, and, and, it, and, and it gives rigor. I mean, I think there's, there's, a, there's an important role for philanthropy for certain, for, for many things, for human rights, for conver, conservation, for the environment. There are many areas where it makes sense to use philanthropy, but there are many areas where, you know, you need, you'd like to have the rigor of the markets, the rigor of, you know, a balance sheet of a property loss. And, and that's what we do. We take these donations, we invest in them, um, in these companies, and, and, and use the rigor of investing. However, our experience is that there's a limited pool of capital for this, you know, this type of venture. Um, the, 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 the ability for us to raise money for these early stage investing, uh, receiving donations to then invest is, is, is limited because the, the majority of capital out there is looking for returns, and the majority is looking for commercial returns. Um, so what we've done over time is create funds that sort of span the two worlds, the uh, you know, purely, um, you know, more venture philanthropy and, um, you know, commercial P and, and um, this is, uh, these are impact funds that balance uh, returns and uh, impact, and 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 we see the need um, to um, you know um, look at the at the at the investments with a different a different uh, filter, and and because we have responsibility to return the capital and the return and 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 hopefully a return to the um, to the investors. Virgilio, just uh, also on your business model. We, we read um, a lot of things about Acumen, it's so interesting, and comparing it to a media, uh, which is also a model that uh, we have a lot of admiration and, and see how they're playing around the world. Uh, we, we met Arjuna from the financial inclusion team, and um, you know they, they have uh, some quite clever guys as well, and uh, basically I think the, the, the idea there is to invest uh, the money. But uh, you, you need to leverage funds from various stakeholders, which is much harder. And, and Omidyar, they allocate their own uh, proceeds, and, and they're considering now uh, raising from, funds from third parties, right? So your job is much harder. Um, I also understood from them that th their mandates could be 100% grants to 100% impact investing. So basically, you know, they can, uh, you know, work across the continuum of capital, uh, with a lot of freedom because they, 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 you know, they have this mission. Do you have a mandate, let's say minus 20%? Uh, what are the KPIs that you need to bind to? And um, just tell us a little bit on, on you know, your, your, your life and how it goes. Because you know, when you have a, a few billion dollars to invest on your own, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a privilege. But when you need to, to, to you know, raise funds as you've done, been doing for all these years, you know, I'm curious to know how these two models relate. Right. So again, Alexander, I, I, I'll make the, you know, the, the point that we have two different vehicles. So on, on the, on our venture, what's more venture philanthropy, the pioneer fund, um, we, we look at, at our investments as businesses. We, we will not give a grant. We will not invest in a company that we don't think has a probability of, of success. Mm -hmm. um, however, the, and, and, and we examine it with the rigor of, of an investment. However, um, there's a very strong social uh, filter and we look at that very deeply. The, the, our, our investment committee looks at the social mm -hmm. impact as much as the uh, business itself. But the difference is that since we have this philanthropy-backed funding, 
and an evergreen fund, we can just be more, uh, we can take bigger risks and we can, um, we see a company that has enormous potential, but the cash, the just how it's going to play out, how many pivots it's going to do, what's, what's going to happen, uh, you know, what the cash flows are uncertain. But this, this vehicle, this philanthropy backed vehicle allows us to invest in such a company. And, and here, what I was talking about before is the team is the most important thing and, and the character of the team and the values. And, and I spend, you know, when I'm making these investments, most, a lot part of my due diligence is spending a lot of time with entrepreneurs and understanding how they think and seeing how they're interacting with their employees and how they interact with, you know, their suppliers. And if you invest with, with, a team that's values align, then things, I mean, you know things are going to get bad at some point and very bad probably, but as, as, as long as you have, um, as, as you have a team that, is go- that you know is going to do the right decision for their employees, for their suppliers, and for their shareholders, you have um, you know, a better chance of, of success. So that's on the venture philanthropy, on the impact, more impact investing side of, of, of things. We, we really have to balance the two things. It's not the same. We can't take the same, um, we can't take the same risk. We, 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 look, we look very carefully at the social impact, but we, we look very carefully at the, at the, at the financials and at the, at the opportunity because we have investors who um, you know, to we, we to whom we've um, committed to return their uh, their capital, and we have a target uh, return which is um, lower than you know PE in emerging markets. But there we have to it's it's a different dynamic, and and also we have um, an investment period, an exit period. So the the way we look at those investments is different, but. And, but still, there's a, a very clear balance, and 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 we don't, um, we do not neglect the social impact um, because of the of the of the financials. Um, but and and once you start moving, it's a slippery slope. I think some funds talk a lot about uh, in you know a social impact, but really, when it comes down to things, the returns are what what uh, matter most, and and I would say that most impact funds are much more on the commercial side than on the um, impact impact side. Okay, thank you. Um, one other thing, uh, when we look at the pillars of venture philanthropy, so basically, you know, tailored finance. Prov- oh, Doug, you want to say something? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead, but, but I do want to make a comment before we uh, before we close. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, you know, we'll def- definitely. <laughs> We, we still have a few minutes. So just, uh, I, I want to uh, talk about capacity building now, which, is, which is, I believe is very important. When we look at the three pillars of venture philanthropy, so tailored finance, you know, uh, uh, providing the type of capital that the entrepreneur needs or the type of capital that the structure needs to be deployed. Um, the uh, providing of technical assistance. So if I'm going to uh, become an entrepreneur in the uh, far regions of, you know, the Amazon, or if I want uh, to succeed in the favelas, you know, uh, or even for the regular entrepreneur, you know, I need to, to be able to have uh, um, a technical assistance. So uh, acceleration, incubation, and so on, right? And, and the third pillar is impact management. Um, maybe Nena uh, and Doug, uh, could you comment on the importance of building capacity, you know, having capacity building uh, across the region, and especially Latin America, because we understand that some countries really focus on that and others don't. So if you look at big society capital, you know, they're focusing more towards impact investing, but not so much on, on capacity building. Uh, South Africa, we learned from KPMG that they weren't uh, working so much on capacity building, but Portugal was. So, you know, how about that? How about the, the importance of preparing uh, the floor you know, and uh, uh, creating accelerators, incubators, or uh, corporate programs to be able to provide technical assistance to the entrepreneurs. Uh, how did that uh, within the region, uh, you know, in Asia, how did that happen? Uh, and then maybe Latin America and other regions. 
one of the things I think uh, Alexandra is the is the the one of the uh, if ever you can the, mute uh, just to help on the echo, please. Okay. So um, I think one of the one of the things we've seen, which I think is really interesting, and uh, is that if you have a well developed ecosystem of uh, incubators and accelerators, you'll actually see a far bigger uh, pipeline of investable enterprises. They're both very linked together. And that is also something that the philanthropic portion of the ecosystem can actually do is support capacity building through, um, you know, uh, supporting incubators, supporting uh, uh, training, supporting, uh, you know, sort of impact measurement, and to really look at building the ecosystem. Because what we also find oftentimes is that the investor invests in the project, but is not really investing in the capacity building elements of that project. And often that is the difference between uh, success and failure. Um, I think, uh, Varhilio, you'll know about the Acumen investments in, in Asia, and, and especially where they partnered with Shell Foundation. Uh, one of the biggest things was that Shell Foundation gave a lot of the grants for capacity building. And that was what provided the difference between success and failure in different markets. Um, if you look at social enterprises and social investing in China, one of the biggest reasons why that marketplace is so nascent is the lack of incubators and accelerators. And one of our members, NPI, has actually done a program exactly that. And we should have a case study that will come out uh, by the beginning of next month, which I'm happy to share with you, which actually talks about how corporates can get involved in helping build capacity of social entrepreneurs. So um, to answer your question, Alexander, I think having without capacity building, you're not going to really see a success in venture philanthropy or looking at any kind of social investment. Totally agree. Uh, Doug, you want to comment? Every nonprofit, every social enterprise is first of all a business. It has to have a team, it has to have a strategy, it has to have an accounting system, it has to have legals, it has to have staffing and, and recruitment. So without capacity building, uh, venture philanthropy and impact investment don't uh, exist. Uh, and going back to the incubators and, and, and the like, uh, I funded along with some others, the, the second impact hub that was ever done uh, which was in the UK at King's Cross. And there's a huge amount of leverage that people can get off of doing this because the amount of money we put in to have that thing start was minimal, right? And if you look at it today, and if you look at the whole impact uh, hub initiatives, they are so much bigger. And so the social return on the money that we put in initially is is minute. I then take that to the EVPA, ABPN, Lato Impacto, uh, the African thing. You know, I'm the initial startup funder, right? And I put in, you know, some good six figure plus numbers into that. But if you look at the, what I put in ABPN, for example, and you look at uh, their budget today, uh, Nana, I, that, it's public, right? What, what you spent? I, I think you said yes. You're on mute, but 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 yes, it's public. But, it's an annual report. Right, right. But but you know they're spending in sing dollars five or seven million, and that it comes from membership fees, and it comes from from grants, and it comes from the government of Singapore, and this and that. So uh, the the thing I'm saying is is fund these startups, and you will get an exponential social return. Uh, on that money. Uh, and another thing is to form new funds. This, uh, when we formed bridges or we formed impetus, we started with $5 million and it's now at 150 million. When we started bridges, we started at about $40 million, but it's now like a billion. Uh, the one in Japan started with 2 million and is now 10 million. And uh, so there's so much thing that you can do if, if, if you're prepared to take that early stage risk, uh, either in the commercial world or, uh, 
or the uh, philanthropic or, or impact investment world. So, so get in early, but capacity building and, and the team, the team is everything, right? You don't have a team, you know, forget it. I'd like to pass on the, the, the word to, to Carolina, our CEO in, in Colombia, uh, for Latin Impacto, for a question, and also like uh, um, to have Georgia, our board member representing Brazil. Afterwards, uh, she has a question, so I'd like her to, to see what comments she has and, and, and the question as well. So, Carolina, you want to uh, go next? Thank you, Alexander. Thank you very much. I thank you everybody for being here with us. Thank you to our speakers. I think we have listened in very remarkable words about how we can continue promoting and integrating the continuum of capital and the importance about that impact. Yes, and I have a question here in the, in the, in the, in the chat regarding what are the bottlenecks that we are seeing for Latin America in terms of a venture philanthropy. And I think something that we are thinking and we are planning to, to, to manage with Latin impact because at the end, I think we don't have any specific bottleneck in Latin America. I think that Nina, uh, she has explained very well the, the, the challenges that she has in, in Asia. And I think they are very common to the ones that we have here in Latin America. And at the end is how we can work together, how we can collaborate better. Uh, and it's the awareness of um, thinking how we can connect uh, philanthropy and how we can connect impact investing and how venture philanthropy plays a very strategic role in the middle. So this is, is, is something we are trying to promote, the importance of improving connections, improving knowledge, and uh, across Latin America. We cannot see our problems like our own problems. What is happening in Brazil is also common to what is happening in other parts of the, in Latin America and also in the world. So you are not alone in Brazil. We are sharing the same problems. And I think that the, the current situation with the COVID is something that shows how we are integrated in the, in the same world. So I think it's something we want to promote, promoting better collaborations, improving connections, leveraging the knowledge, and how we can continue promoting more capital across the continuum of, of this capital. So I think it's, it's not a specific bottleneck that we are living in Brazil or in Latin America. It's how we can uh, share our problems and how we can work together um, and it's something that we are promoting with Latin Pacto, having this kind of webinars and then improving the DLSR platform that is something successful in, in Asia. And as Naina told us, it, she, she is willing to share all the, the, the knowledge and, and the goodwill that she's having in Asia, we want to replicate here in Latin America. And I will, I will invite also uh, Georgia, our board member also like you, Alexander in Brazil, because I see that she also, have a, uh, she also has a question. So Georgia, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is great. Um, I think uh, it's great to see Doug and, uh, and to get to know finally Nina uh, and see all the, the friend faces uh, virtually. So it's, it's really, great for the heart and for the health of, of this isolation time that we are facing. Uh, and I'm taking this really seriously. So um, uh, this is just great to, to see how, you know, Doug has been a champion uh, providing seed money to this uh, startup process of, of building the network of venture philanthropy all over the globe. And I think um, what we're trying to learn here and do in Latin America is bring others uh, to this effort of collaboration. And, and it was great to hear you, Nina. Um, and uh, it's, it's amazing to see the, the Venture Philanthropy Network in Asia to take off so, so quickly. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of work and lessons learned uh, behind that. That would be great for us to get acquainted with, with things and, and fast track our process here. But uh, one thing that comes to my mind is, uh, in order to to fill up the funding gap and 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 incrementally uh, build the, the the funding that you have right now, um, how was uh, the work uh, and the environment building process to get, especially conventional philanthropy, uh, working? along and building and open the mind for the venture philanthropy uh, approach and concept 
which is something that we are trying really hard to, to build in Brazil. And of course, uh, we have a, a lot of philanthropists, uh, not a lot, but a few philanthropists in Brazil with appetite uh, to put the steps on, on, on venture philanthropy. But it's also amazing to hear uh, how other uh, 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 countries and, 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 and areas in the globe and geographies in the globe are building this environment uh, to, to get the conventional philanthropy, venture philanthropy, uh, to work together with uh, the venture capital and the social responsible capital as well in this ecosystem that we're trying to build to, 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 to get things differently in a sustainable way uh, to, to still have a planet in the future. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, I, I think that there was a question there for Nana. Uh. Uh, okay, I was just wondering, okay. So I think Georgia, in answer to your question is how do you get philanthropists, you know, traditional philanthropists to look at uh, embracing venture philanthropy? I think for us in Asia, what we looked at was when you talked about venture philanthropy, you talked about a multi-year commitment, you talked about building capacity, you talked about... Um, sort of measuring the impact. You talked about being strategic in terms of uh, what you were sort of sticking to a field that you were or a cause that you were going to support. Um, a lot of this traditional philanthropists actually believe in. They just don't call it venture philanthropy. And that's what we felt. So what we, I think uh, when Doug started initially and when I, when I joined AVPN, a lot of what we did initially was really break down venture philanthropy into seven or eight practices and actually explain those practices as we were talking about venture philanthropy. And we found that both a lot of traditional philanthropists as well as you know family offices, as well as corporates that wanted to get into the field understood and uh, identified with these practices. So they may not be doing all seven at once, but maybe they did four of them or they did five of them. And they were then interested in, as they got more uh, sort of uh, immersed into the process, they got more interested in adopting them. What we also realized is that, you know, by bringing different groups of people together, they do find areas to align and partner. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, people, you know, we think that foundations are going to be um, you know, take it negatively if the later part of their investment is taken by someone who's actually making a financial return. What we don't seem to realize is that foundations and grant makers are interested only at a certain segment of the market because that is what they want to help. So when, that, when the business outgrows that segment, let's say, you know, initially they start making a small profit, then the foundation wants to go back to helping somebody who cannot actually make any financial return. And without that grant, they are going to go out of business. So they are quite happy to hand over that investment to the next person in the value chain of that investment. And that is how that whole continuum of capital ends up being stitched together. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, it's a, I would love to know more about the eight uh, uh, fields of work that Happy help. Uh, that. Uh, that would be great, yes. but thank you. Sure. Okay, sure. Uh, just uh, uh, to be able to finish, um, uh, I, I would like to, uh, to ask uh, um, uh, uh, our uh, speakers to uh, give, uh, give us our, uh, their uh, final remarks here. Also to uh, thank them uh, so much for participating today and, and teaching us and telling us, you know, how this has been done around the world. Um, and, and finally, the, uh, I believe I'd just like to uh, tell all of you participants, you know, how, how impressed we are with the governance of Latin Pacto, all of the uh, parties involved, uh, Alex and Jose Luis. Uh, Alex is here, Alvarez and Jose Luis, who started uh, the project with us, helping to build the, the you know, this network for Latin America. Uh, Carolina, who's been with us since the beginning, and Greta, and Doug, and everybody. So really, it's been uh, 
uh, an incredible journey and, and uh, very few times in my life have I seen such a, a well-organized uh, 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 and sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, command uh, and, and leadership for, for a project. So uh, thank you so much for the opportunity from all of us here in Brazil and in Latin America. Thank you so much for giving us the invitation and, you know, for, for letting us uh, come and share with you. So uh, all the very best and I hope to see most of you or some of you uh, in Asia and hopefully we can look at cross projects that we can do together. And you can also come, come back to Latin America, Nana. You are always welcome here. Love Thank you. Have you Thank here. You, I would love to. Thank you, Nana. You're so kind. Virgilio, did you want to add something yeah, else? Yeah, no, I would, I would just say, um, you know, as a parting um, word, just do it. I, I, get out of your comfort zone. If you're a foundation that's only been, been doing grants, think about doing, you know, uh, an equity invest investment maybe, or a debt or returnable grant. Just, you know, if you're a more traditional investor, think about, um, you know, a small allocation to an impact fund. I think it's you, it's, it's, it's not, um, um, it, it's not uh, nuclear physics. It's, it's a lot of common sense and it's, it's understanding how you balance um, returns uh, on the social side and the financial side, but um, it's um, also hugely rewarding. So um, I would just, uh, that, that would be my parting words. Oh, okay, from, from my perspective, uh, there's one thing that, that uh, I had overlooked uh, in, in Asia, 8% of our members so that's uh, about 50 members or, or so are from European countries. 8% uh, of our members are from the U US. So what they're interested in is seeing a large participation by local members because they want to do stuff in, in these various geographies, but they don't have the local contacts and the local visibility. So we need to get to a hundred plus members in Lato and Pacto as soon as possible. And then we will see more foreign uh, money coming in and everybody wants to see that. So uh, the thing, biggest thing that, that I detest is what I call the fence setters, right? Well, we think it's a good idea. You know, you go out and show that it really happens and then, you know, we'll do something and, People who tell me no, that's fine. I just move on. People who say yes, I embrace. The fence sitters, so, so don't be a fence sitter. The, the second thing to say is that uh, it's all about the team. And Carolina and Alex and the uh, Lato Impacto Board, which includes uh, Alexandra and, and Georgia uh, and six or seven uh, others, maybe seven others, uh, uh, are all really committed to seeing this happen. And we just need as much participation as possible from Brazil. And thank you very much. Obrigado. <laughs> thank you, Doc. Thank you, Fernanda, Alexander. Once again, thank you, Virgilio, Naina, and of course, Georgia and Alejandro for being here with us. I think that we are building this movement. And as I, Doc, told, we need more people to continue building this movement to create the changes, the, the changes that we need in, in Latin America. And just to announce our next events, we will have, uh, I, I have seen here the invitation, next week we'll have uh, Stephen Sarnels, uh, the EVPA uh, share that he will share with us the corporate social initiative that they are promoting and we'll have FEMSA, Fundación FEMSA from Mexico. Carolina, we cannot see this you can, yes, no, I, I, I can. We can see the slide, but we cannot see the this social corporate yes, webinar. Yes, something is happening with why. the web PowerPoint. I don't know what happened. Ah, okay. but just to announce that it will be on September next week on September second. September. So you, yeah. you will receive the invitation uh, after we finish this webinar, and I hope that we can continue engage with us. We're having some our board members, but also our 
some members from our uh, strategic advisory board and we also appreciate that you are joining us today and that we can continue building this movement in Brazil but also in Latin America. So thank you very much for joining us today. We will share the presentation, the, the takeaways and also we started recording these, these presentations so we will, we will share all with you and have a wonderful week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye -bye. Thank you.